Good morning, welcome back. We're going to continue with uh, what I call linear learning and what the rest of the world call linear regression. Um, I call it linear learning to um, uh, sort of emphasize the point that this is a form of learning uh, and that it makes its own assumptions, but it falls in the same framework that we've been talking about until now. Uh, and I'm, I wrote a reminder for you of what are the three questions that I'd like you to ask for every machine learning technique or algorithm that's out there. Number one, hard bias. Number two, soft bias. Number three, search. I added 2A because we're inserting, I started inserting this idea of regularization that what um, the result of, of Q1 is a hard set called the hypothesis, the hypothesis space. The result of Q2 is an optimization criterion. It's something like an argmin or an argmax. And 2A adds another term to this optimization criterion. We're trying to not just um, uh, find something that has the minimum um, uh, error or the best agree agreement with the data, but also um, satisfy some other condition. Uh, question two is about the soft bias. The, it's about the preference. So the condition could be the uh, number of nodes in a tree, if it's a tree, the size of the coefficients, if it's a polynomial or degree of the polynomial and so forth. But regularization could include other components too. I mentioned that in the context of decision trees. Um, if you're trying to come up with a tree that uh, uses less expensive medical tests, then you would throw in a term there that um, would be proportional to the cost of the tests, and then you would try to minimize a combination, a weighted combination of the two. Uh, and then question three is the algorithmic question. Once you defined the argmin or argmax, the optimization problem, now it's a question of finding the one member that satisfies it. So we're going back to uh, linear learning. And I'd like to spend a little bit more time on the law of total variance. We said that we take a random variable y, which is the one we care about, the one we're trying to explain. Um, and we try to explain it in terms of some other random variable x, which may be more than one random variable, but just very simplistically we'll call it x. Uh, you might notice that I use both parentheses and angled brackets, and you might wonder what the difference between them is. There's really no difference between them. Just um, I think it's a convention that expectation is sometimes written with square brackets. In, um, in physics, expectations are written as angled brackets without the E sign. Um, so I don't know of much difference between them. So I'll, I'll just use, I'll use them both because they're easier to parse if, if you do that. You know which goes with what. With what. Um, so we break down the variance, or you can say the uncertainty in y, uh, the variance, the uncertainty, the spread, um, in terms of the variance of the expectation of y given x. So I'll do this, plus the expectation of the variance of y given x. So it's always y given x, y given x and it's the variance of the expectation, the expectation of the variance. And the way to understand that, to start parsing it, is to ask yourself, whenever we take the variance or the expectation, with regard to what variable are we talking about, since there are two variables here. And the answer is, the first one we do is the y. And the second one is the x. I try to explain it in, on Piazza as well. This is the portion of the variance of the variance of y explained by x. 
And this is the portion remaining unexplained. I gave you an example of um, clustering where y is a point in some dimensional space, could be high dimension, in my example it was two dimensions, and x was the index of the cluster, which cluster does it belong to? And a good clustering, a good assignment of points to clusters is one where the points are very close around the cluster which means the variance, once you know the center of the cluster, you reduce significantly the spread of y, because you know it's right near you, right? That would be an example like once you know the center of each cluster, the remaining variance is very small in each one of them, and therefore the average of that remaining variance is small. And this would be the remaining variance. This is the variance of y once you know the cluster. Each one of these points is this variance of y. I'm sorry, each one of the variances here is variance of y, each one of the spreads there. And then this e is the averaging across all of the clusters, averaging, of course, weighted by how many points are in the cluster. Whereas here, the expected value of y given any x is the centroid. And we're looking at the variance of the centroid. So that's called the cross cluster variance. Within cluster variance, cross cluster variance. I want to give you another example, this time taken from linear regression, which we will talk about in more detail in a minute. Imagine that x and y are both in one dimension. So this is um, this is x and this is y and we fit a straight line. Oh, well, that's not the least error line, so let's put it like this. How do we interpret these two? Uh, components in the context of linear regression? Well, remember that we're using x to try to explain y. What we're saying is that given x, we don't know where y is, but we know where the expectation of y is. So if we had lots and lots of points on that all share the same x, the y value would not always be the same, but it would be distributed around here somewhere. So let's start with this part. The variance of y conditioned on a specific value of x is the variance along this line here for this x and here for this x and here for this x and for this x. And then the expected value of that over all the x's is the weighted average of all these variances. x is continuous now, so we'll have to integrate, but it's still a weighted average in the sense that if there are more x's here, more data points in this region than there are in this region, it would count more. But overall, we're looking at the variance of y along the regression line, relative to the regression line. That would be the part of the variance of y that's not, that remains after we took into account x. We know x, we took into account, we got to this point, there's still some variance, there's still some spread here. Go back to this part. This is the expectation of y, condition on x, which by definition is the straight line. And then we take the variance of that over x. So how much does that change as we change x? So this part, is basically explains how the e of y changes as x changes, whereas this part explains how, does actual, how do actual y values are spread or how they change for a fixed value 
um, once we take into account the line. You can um, do this kind of this composition in other contexts as well. Uh, so I, I view this as a more general uh, formula and a more worth remembering than any one of the examples of cross thrust variance, uh, within cluster variance, and so forth. Let's look at the analogy between this and information theory. In information theory, we also try to explain why given x, and we're also usually in a case where we can do a partial job, not complete. We can explain some of it, but not the rest of it. The analog of variance of y would be entropy of y. What would be the analog of the portion of the variance of y explained by x? It would be the portion of the entropy of y, of the uncertainty in y, explained by x. What's a good expression for that? Louder, please. Louder, the, a portion of the entropy of y that's explained by x. No, explained by x. That would be mutual information. The mutual information between y and x. This is exactly how much of the entropy of y x explains. Not what fraction, but how much of it in bits. If this is 5.2 bits, and this could be 3.7 bits, and the difference here would be now it's conditional entropy. It's how much of the, of the uncertainty of y still remains if you know x. Explained by x, still unexplained. Question? Uh, uh, I'm still a little bit confused by the, in the line example, the left expression. OK. Uh, um, so let's parse this in the case of the linear regression. E of y condition on x is a function of x, and it's by definition of how we constructed the line, it's this line. Okay? Now we're asking for the variance along this line. What do we really mean by that? Underlying it all is a joint distribution over x and y. It's possible that the joint distribution is much heavier here. So if I look at the marginal over x, the marginal of x may not be uniform. There may be more x's in this region than there are in this region. This variance over x will capture um, that, that phenomenon. It will take into account uh, the, the, the different distribution along x. One big difference between these two ways of thinking is that variance is defined over numerical random variables. Only numerical random variables, or more accurately, random variables we can define a distance measure. Typically, it would mean numericals. If you look at the formula for variance and expectation and so forth, they have subtraction in there. You, you should be able to subtract. Um, and square numbers. Mutual information quantities are defined over any kind of random variable. It doesn't matter what values they take. They can take as values the days of the week. They can take as values the cities of the world. They can take as values colors and emotions. Mutual information doesn't care what the values are of the random variables, only what the distribution is. So there are situations where these are two different ways of measuring uncertainty or spread or you know, how, how accurately you can pin down something. Um, but they're very, very different in the character. This is more appropriate to call a spread because it's in a, in a distance measure, in a, in a, in a metric space. Uh, this is easier to think of in terms of there is a whole bunch of possible outcomes, and each one has different probability, and which one is more likely to happen, and so forth. And the outcomes are not related necessarily to a metric space. All right, let's go back to our um, browse-through um, linear regression concepts. We talked about covariance, if you remember. 
covariance between two random variables, x and y. And we said that covariance was invariant under shift of either x or y. And it's fairly um, simple to calculate what happens under multiplication. A of x and b of y, remind you, a and b are constants, is, I'll call it c here, is a times c times covariance of x and y. So even if you add here ax plus b and cx plus d, the b and the d go away, and the a and the c come out. I want to simplify the covariance even further. I want to normalize it by the spread of each x and y. So I'll take the covariance, and I'll divide it by the standard error of x and the standard error of y. What I'm doing essentially is getting rid of the, dimension, of the units or the dimensions. Um, if you remember, if x and y are originally in meters, then the expectations are in meters, the variances are in meters squared, the standard error is in meters, the covariance is in meters squared, right? You can literally see they showed here twice. By doing this, I'm dividing meters squared by meters squared, or times squared by times squared, or x could be meters and y could be seconds, right? So I'll be dividing meters times seconds by meters times seconds. So in, any, in both cases I get, in all these cases, I get the pure number. And this pure number we call a row is the coefficient of correlation, a correlation coefficient. Uh, co of correlation. Now, let me make that clear. It's a coefficient of linear correlation. And often in everyday language, people drop the word linear. And they talk about coefficient of correlation, the correlation coefficient. I strongly suggest you don't do that because it's important to know that this is linear correlation, and that, in fact, variables can be correlated very strongly, but not linearly. They could have a very, very strong relationship, but the linear coefficient, linear correlation could be zero. So by keeping the word linear in there, it would remind you um, that this is only talking about a linear relationship, not about any other kind of relationship that they might have. When we do this, um, we're guaranteed that the correlation of linear, um, the coefficient of linear correlation is going to be between negative one and positive one. Positive corresponds to a positive association between x and y, and negative, of course, to a negative association. Taking into account this formula, you can see that uh, the correlation coefficient between ax plus b and cx plus d has at least the same properties as the covariance, namely it's invariant under shift of either x or y, so we can get rid of b and d but it's also invariant under multiplication by A and C because the A and C that we got here are going to also come out of here. The only um, slight caveat is that here these are defined as positive square roots, so there may be a change of sign if we multiply it by if A or C are negative. So this ends up being the um, sine of A times C times the rho or correlation coefficient of X and Y. So the sine of A times C basically means 
If A and C are both positive or are both negative, it doesn't change. If one of them is positive, one of them is negative, the direction of the correlation changed. This is really useful. The take home message here is that linear correlation is invariant under any shift and stretching or multiplication of the um, of x and y. So think of x and y as coordinates in two-dimensional space. If you now take a whole bunch of data points, maybe we should first do examples of uh, this. This is an example of nice linear correlation. The linear correlation here is probably very large, something like 0 0.9 something, 9.5. What if you took this and shifted it, uh, uh, rotated it to look like this? What does the linear correlation become now? Took these data points and shifted them. It remains the same, okay? The slope is not important. The only thing that's important is how close these things are to the line. If you moved it up or down, if you moved it sideways, it doesn't change the linear correlation. If you shifted it to the point where it's sloping this way, so this is still rho equals 0 0.95. If you shifted it so now it's facing down, what's the correlation now? Same data points? Negative. It's a negative. Oops. Negative 0 0.95. We pass through a point where um, we had a, a singularity, where we had, um, um, I don't know what would happen at the, between negative, would it be zero, would it be undefined? Uh, da, 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 da. C standard error is the same. Um, it would be zero it would be zero. So there's a single point where it would be zero and then it would become negative. Um, what about this? What's rho here? Kind of harder to tell, but the question is, is there a preferred direction? Does it look like there's a preferred direction? There is a preferred direction, it's going up, it's a positive slope, so rho would be positive here, but maybe not very large. What about this? Points are distributed around the circle. What's rho here? It's zero, there's no preferred direction. Okay, let's assume that they have uniform density around, around the circle. Now here's an interesting thing. X and Y here, for, first of all, this circle can move anywhere, right? It can shift up or down. We already said that correlation coefficient is invariant under shifting and under stretching and under rotation because rotation is a form of shifting and stretching. Um, but here, these points are clearly highly related to one another. X and Y are highly related to one another. If I tell you X, you know a lot about Y. If I told you that X was here, this is the X value, you immediately know that Y would be either here or here. Right? If I told you that X was here, you know it's exactly this point. So before I tell you X, Y could be anywhere from here to here with some distribution. After I tell you X, it could be only this point or this point. Let's say now that the points are distributed completely uniformly around the circle. So after I told you X, there's a 50% chance they would be here and 50% chance they would be here. That means the entropy, remaining entropy of Y, knowing X, is just one bit two li equally likely possibilities. So X told me a lot about Y, meaning that mutual information between Y and X 
y and x is clearly positive. And yet, rho of x and y, or of y and x to make it, is 0. Take home message, you can have zero linear correlation and still have high mutual information. Is the opposite possible? Can you have zero mutual information but positive or negative linear correlation? Why not? What does zero mutual information tell us about X and Y? They're independent. Oh, this is important enough to write on a big, big new board. This is an important relationship. Mutual information between two random variables is zero if and only if they're independent. And it's important to know the definition of independence. Where does zero linear correlation fit in? If x and y are independent, they cannot be linearly correlated. You can try to convince yourself of that from, from the formula. But this is a one-way street. This is not true. Interesting to uh, write down the definitions of these two and compare them. <clears throat> if you remember this as our, our definition of uh, one form of, mutual, of writing mutual information is the expectation of the log of the ratio of joint to product of marginals. Here, we already wrote, is the covariance of x and y. Uh, I guess we write it like this, divided by of x. I think it's kind of interesting to look at the two definitions side by side. Questions so far? Yeah? Uh, see why, thank you. X and Y. So. Is this a good enough Y? No. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm glad you guys are watching. Okay, let's talk about linear regression in the context of machine learning. Um, remember, I'm trying to broaden our definition of um, learning from learning a deterministic function to reducing the uncertainty in the outcome. 
So instead of thinking about it as for every x there is a y and we need to find that y, we try to think about it as there's some uncertainty about y and if we have x we can use it to reduce that uncertainty. In the most general context, we're talking about information theory, we're talking about uncertainty measured by entropy. In a numerical context, we can talk about the spread in y, reducing the spread in y, um, knowing x. And um, the, maybe the simplest relationship we can think about of using x to reduce the spread in y is to say that the expectation of y conditioned on x to assume that it is linear in, um, in x. So that would be alpha plus beta x. This is not saying that y is a linear function of x. It's saying that the expectation of y is a linear function of x. This could be expressed equivalently in a different way. We can say that y is a random variable that is produced by taking x and putting it through a linear transformation, multiplying by beta and adding alpha, and adding some extra amount called epsilon called the residual. The residual is the difference between what we think would be the expectation of y and the actual y. And saying that, saying this is equivalent to saying this and saying that the expectation of epsilon is zero. So epsilon is a random variable that has some distribution. We don't know what. The only thing we know about it is um, that it's, its expectation is zero by definition. Now, sometimes people are tempted to call this the error. It's not really an error. We never said that y is exactly a linear function of x. We only said that the expectation of y is a linear function of x. So calling it error is not quite right. The better name for it is a residual. That's the technical term. Question. Plus epsilon. Epsilon. This is the same epsilon as here. Uh, I, get, I know, my epsilon is not great. Um, the second thing about this epsilon is uh, you might be tempted to say, let's assume it's Gaussian. Okay, that's what you usually see in treatments. Not yet. Not yet. It could be something else. In fact, other formulations of it lead to other uh, forms of linear regression, not a standard form of linear regression. The important thing here at this point is that it's a random variable with some distribution. The only thing we know about the distribution expectation is zero. If we make this assumption, this is called the linear model. Linear model includes not just simple ordinary linear regression, it also includes logistic regression, it also includes a variety of other regressions. Alpha uh, and beta are the parameters. And now we can ask how do we fit these parameters, how do we learn these parameters? Given uh, data, training examples, in the form of x1, y1 through xn, yn. We want to find alphas and betas uh, that would fit it as well as, as we can by some measure of, of uh, fitting. If we defined epsilon sub i, as yi minus alpha plus beta xi. So this is the residual for an individual data point. 
we can impose a condition that we want this residual to be minimized in some sense. How do we minimize them is up to us. Let's assume now that we're going to minimize the sum of their squares. This assumption corresponds to the assumption that the residuals are distributed normally with a Gaussian. This is where the Gaussian assumption comes in. Only at the point where we decide to minimize the sum of squared residuals. If we try to minimize some other function of the residuals, it would correspond to a different assumption of noise or residuals. So we will look for the set of alpha and beta that minimize oops, minimize the sum of squared residuals over all possible alpha and beta. So it's a joint optimization over two parameters. This can be written obviously exactly the same thing. Alpha or beta sum i goes from 1 to n of y i minus alpha plus beta x i squared. I just took this definition. If we, this is an assumption we made. When we make this assumption, the solution is called the ordinary least square solution. Standing OLS. Question? Um, sorry, I think you forgot to answer my question last time. Because uh, I was asking about why, uh, how did you come up with why? How did I come up with why? Yeah. What do you mean by that? So uh, you're saying that y equals alpha plus beta x plus epsilon, mm -hmm. and why is that? So uh, what I have is a world in which there are two random variables, one of which I'm trying to explain or predict, that's why. The other one is I, something I have and I believe is related. I believe it sheds some light on y, okay? The whole name of the game is what can I, how can I best use x to determine y? Of course, this is almost all of machine learning, right? Because x could be a very large combination of things. x could be an image and y could be a category of the image and so forth. So I'm using here two simple variables, but it's really all of machine learning is an x and y. x is what we have, our input, y is the output. Why did I make this assumption? because it's an easy assumption to make and to derive results with. Uh, you're quite right that there may be situations where the linear relationship is not a reasonable assumption. Okay, so this goes back to our question of bias. You know, why did I choose this bias? Well, uh, because it's, a, it's the easiest, simplest bias to start with and to analyze. Is it appropriate? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Okay, if we pose our problem this way, uh, we now have a search problem. Search the space of all alphas and betas, it's a two-dimensional continuous space, for the values that minimize this. Luckily, there is a closed form analytical solution. We don't need to do explicit search, there's a formula that we can use, I'll just give it to you. It's a very nice, I think, and satisfying formula. Um, I'll start with the beta. The beta OLS is the covariance of x and y divided by the variance of, uh, of x. Now, let me add some index here, sub e. And by e, I mean empirical. So, I'm taking the covariance and variance with regard to the empirical distribution of x and y. The empirical distribution of x and y is a fancy term for their distribu the distribution of the training data I have. 
E means with regard to the empirical distribution of x, y. The empirical distribution of x, y is basically this. The empirical distribution of x, y is 1 over n for each x, i, y, i that occurred and 0 otherwise. And of course, if the same x, i, y, i occurred more than once, it'll be 2 over n, 3 over n, and so forth. But the empirical distribution, the most general form for it, would say the number of times x and y occurred divided by n. Number of times they occurred in the training data. So it's important to know this is not the true distribution of x and y. It's just a sample from it. But it's the distribution of the sample, as if the sample was all there is. So if you now accept the meaning of E as empirical distribution, uh, the formula becomes very nice. This is, looks like a little bit like a formula for a slope of a line. This is the relationship between x and y divided by the base for x. And the formula for alpha is even simpler. Alpha ordinarily square is the expectation of y minus beta times the expectation of x. And the alphas and alpha and beta, of course, correspond to, in the linear regression, correspond to describing this line. The slope of this line is beta, and its intercept here is alpha. I'm sorry? Here? Thank you. It's the expected. So another way of writing it would be y bar, which is a common way of writing the sample average, minus beta x bar. Questions? Is there any way we can start from this? Uh -huh. These are two are completely equivalent. The com this combined with this condition, you can clearly derive this, right? So the question was, can we start from the second one rather than from the first one? If I start from this, and I say, what is the expectation of y given x? It's the expectation of alpha, which is alpha, plus the expectation of beta times x, which is beta times the expectation of x, plus the expectation of epsilon, which is 0. So from this, you can derive this. And from this, you can derive that. There are just two formulations of the same thing. Um, so if you want to uh, derive the first equation from the second equation, it should it be the, uh, should the alpha times beta uh, alpha plus beta times the expected value of x. Because you're plugging that y to the alpha expected value. Um, I don't think so, but let's, um, let's discuss that after class. I don't want to um, take the time now. Yeah? Can you repeat the definition of the OLS? Definition of OLS. The definition of OLS is given here. It is whichever values of alpha and beta minimize the sum of the squared residuals. Mm 
And the residuals, even though they look like these nice little epsilons, they're actually a function of alpha and beta and xi and yi. Each one of them is a function of yi, xi, alpha, and beta. So spelling it out explicitly, it's the values of the two parameters, alpha and beta, that minimize this expression, sum of squared residuals. Let me uh, move quickly to generalizing this to multiple dimensions. I'm going to repeat the process. It might make it uh, clearer if we repeat it, but we'll repeat it with more than one covariant. Now we're trying to learn a function from x1 through xp into y. Now we're explicitly saying that x could be multiple uh, covariates. And by convention, we use lowercase p as the number of covariates. So these indices now, it's important to know, like the general case here of xj, x sub j is not the jth data point. It is the a random variable number j. And every data point is actually Every data point in our training examples would be a whole set of values for all the random variables complete with a value for y. So it would be a vector of size p plus 1, p covariates and one response variable. Again, we're going to assume a linear relationship um, between the expectation of y and the covariates. So we're going to assume that the expectation of y conditioned on x1 through xp is a linear function. Alpha plus sum of beta j xj, j goes from 1 to p. I'm going to simplify my notation a little bit. I don't want to carry this alpha with me. I will decide that beta 0 is alpha. So I'll call this beta sub 0. And I'll simplify it further by pretending that there's another random variable, x sub 0, that is not really a random variable. It's always fixed at the value of 1. So x sub 0 is always 1. This is just a notational trick. I'm not, not doing anything mathematical here. So this becomes simple summation of beta j xj. Uh, j goes this time from 0 to p. And another way of writing it is simply as a dot product between the beta vector and the x vector. So you're going to see all these notations in different forms. They all mean the same thing. I will say equivalently, this assumption that the conditional expectation of y is just a linear combination of the in of the covariates is the same as saying that y is a random variable that consists of this linear combination of inputs plus some residual and the expect expected value of the residual is zero. Exactly the same as over there. Now I want to um, find the value of these parameters. So these are my parameters. The betas are my parameters. Beta 0 through beta, J, beta p are the parameters. Did I write p? Yeah. Uh, I want to derive them from data. What does my data look like now? In the one-dimensional case, it looks like two vectors, xi's and yi's. Here, I'm going to have a whole matrix of x's. 
and a vector of y's. So it's going to look like this. X, sorry, it's going to be little x, little x1, 1, 1, x1, 2, x1, p. So these are, um, this is the value of the random variable x1, xp, these are the random variables. Let me rewrite the whole thing so it looks a little nicer. On top I will write the name of the random variable. The name of the random variable is an uppercase. It's x1, xj, all the way to xp. And here I'll have y. These are the names. Here I'm going to have, this is j, this is i. i goes from 1 to n. Little n is the number of data points I have. Little x11 is the value of the first random variable in the first training example. Little x1j is the value of the xj random variable, the xj, the jth attribute in the first training example. All the way to x1p, and here I'll have the xi1, xij, xip, and here I have xn1, xnj, and x n comma p. So I have a matrix here. I have an n by p matrix. It is also called the design matrix. And here I have the response variable y1 through yn. This is the typical setup for a multi, multivariate linear regression. Given this data set, I want to learn or fit the values of the parameters, which are the betas. I'm going to define completely equivalently to what we did over there, epsilon i is yi minus beta xi. And now, I don't know how to write beta xi in this notation. Well, you guys can see it from there, so let me move it a little bit. Let me move it to here. I'll define epsilon i as yi minus the sum over j goes from 0 to p of uh, beta j times x i j. And I'm trying to find the value, the best values of the beta vector. Now it's up to me to decide what I consider the best value. I'm trying to minimize the, uh, the, the residuals, but there are different ways I can minimize it to correspond to different assumptions about how y is distributed around its expectation. Again, I'm going to make the same assumption I made in the first case, that y is distributed Gaussianly around its expectation. This would correspond to minimizing the sum of squared residuals. When we do logistic regression, we will make a different assumptions about how, about how it's distributed and it will correspond to a different uh, function to minimize. When I make this assumption of Gaussian noise or Gaussian distribution, I get a set of betas that are considered the ordinary least square betas. And this corresponds to argmax, sorry, argmin over all vectors beta. of the sum of squared residuals. It goes from 1 to n, or it can be written explicitly 
argmin over betas of the sum of yi minus um, sum j beta j xij um, and that would be squared like this and j goes from zero from zero to p and this goes from i goes from one to n this is exactly the same just a slight generalization again we have a closed form solution you don't need to copy the formulas they're all here the far less likely to be erroneous here than here um, there's a closed form solution I'd like to keep this solution keep the solution in mind remember this is a special case where alpha is beta sub zero and beta is just beta one right this is the special case where p equals one but the solution requires some manipulation of this matrix so if we call this matrix the X matrix design matrix the beta OLS is given by the form following formula. It's x dx to the negative one times x d y. This is a matrix notation. This is transpose x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Compare this to covariance x and y divided by variance of x. This negative one is a generalization into matrices of the inverse operation, right? This is an inverse matrix, so you can think about it as if it were here underneath uh, the denominator. So this corresponds to the normalization by the variance. This corresponds to the covariance. So you're looking at how these two co-vary, what they tell you about each other, and you're normalizing it by the variance of x itself. Now this seems uh, trivial to calculate, but now this is maybe not so trivial. Now we have a matrix with n and p, and n and p could be large, so it's worth thinking about the computational efficiency of the operations. How much work is it to figure out this answer? Well, let me remind you that multiplying two matrices Multiplying a, uh, they call it M by N, a Q by R. Multiplying a Q by R by an R by S. So this is multiplying a Q by R matrix by an R by S matrix uh, takes order of uh, Q times R times S operations. Uh, when we multiply square matrices, there are tricks we can do, but for um, gen general non-square matrices, this is pretty much um, unless you know something special about them. If you're multiplying a square matrix, Say n by n times n by n. The naive method, not taking into account that it's square, will take order n cubed, q times r to s, 
but there is a huge number of algorithms that try to reduce that and uh, best used to take this much but the best algorithms now do it in order of n times 2 to the 3, 7, 3, something like that and this could still be improved on. There's lots of algorithms that work recursively and uh, other ways. This is for generic square matrices. If you know something else about them, like they're sparse, there are even, even better things you can do. All right, so given these, um, these facts, let's figure out what it takes to calculate this. How long does it take to create this thing inside the parentheses? How many operations? X is n by p. So x transpose is p by n. So this is p by n times n by p. And therefore it takes p times n times p. It takes p squared times n operations. Then we have to take its inverse. Taking the inverse of a, a matrix of a square matrix is uh, takes the same amount of computation as multiplying it with another one like it. The the um, naive method is O n cubed. The smart method is O two to the whatever. How big is this matrix when it's done? It's p by p, right? We have to invert a p by p matrix which means it'll take, this is big O, by the way, not little O. It takes on the order of P to the 2.373. All right, what about this? This is X transpose is P by N, and Y is N by 1. P by N times N by 1, it's p times n times 1. So this is order of p times n. And finally, the inverse of this is still p by p. And this is uh, p by 1. So multiplying them together, you have p by p times p by 1. You get p times p. So this is order of p squared. And these operations are done together, you know, one after the other. So we get a total of order p squared times n plus p to the 2 times 373 3 plus p, what is this, p times n, plus p squared. Now p squared is subsumed by this one, right? It's strictly less than p. And p times n is subsumed by p squared times n. So we're left with just this part. Is this a lot? Is this a difficult computation? Is it, will, it, will you have a hard time um, on your computer? Depending on how big your matrix is. The important thing to notice here is the dependence on N. n is the number of data points you have. How does this algorithm behave computationally as a function of the amount of data? It's linear. It's linear in the amount of training data. Linear in the number of data points, to be specific. Linear in the number of examples. <coughs> number of examples or training, training examples or training data. But it's not linear in P. P is the number of covariates. 
How many covariates are you likely to have? A hundred? So the dominant part here would be this part, or if n is large, it would be this part. So p squared, if you have a hundred, that's 10,000. So it'll be 10,000 times the number of data elements. You know, most regression problems, um, n is much larger than p. Okay? You have some finite number of some countable, easy number of covariates, 3, 5, 20, 50, 100. And then you go and collect data, and you try to collect hundreds of thousands or millions of examples, most examples. So usually in a world where n is much greater than p, we don't really have a problem. This is dominated by n, and it's linear in n. You really can't ask for much more than that. It's linear is almost as good as it gets, right? I mean, that's... But there are situations where p is greater than, much greater than n. We'll discuss them um, soon. We call that sparse estimation. This solution doesn't work in these cases. So we need to do something else. We need to regularize it. But if we still have to go through this something like computation like that, then the dominant part would be the p either here or here. So for most everyday normal uses of linear regression, the algorithm is fast and linear in the number of examples. It's not a problem. If n is more than p, no problem. Okay, we could do this calculation differently. After we calculate the inverse here, we can multiply it by x and then multiply by y. It will result in slightly different arrangement. It won't be better. Let's talk about inverting this. Okay, is this matrix always going to be invertible? As you know, matrices sometimes are not. Is this matrix guaranteed to be invertible? I'm sorry? Not necessarily. Can you think of a case where it's not? Yes, if you have columns that are repeated, in other words, if the, so columns, our values of uh, specific covariates, let's say xj and xk here. If these columns are either the same or a linear combination of one another, then the rank of this matrix is going to be smaller than p, because you don't have p-independent columns. And if the rank is smaller than p, xtx will not be invertible. Now, if um, n is much larger than p, and the data is collected randomly, drawn randomly, and typically has some noise in it, this is highly unlikely to happen. But if the covariates themselves uh, were defined as combinations of each other, then by definition they will be combinations. You know, if, if you measured, if you collected covariates from different sources and you brought in temperature measurements in Fahrenheit and your friend brought in temperature measurements in Celsius and they came from the same thermometer, you just did the multiplication, then unbeknownst to you, you have um, you know, linearly, linearly related covariates. So you will have this problem. If P is much larger than N, or if P is larger than N, period, then it's guaranteed that some of the columns would be linearly related because the rank of the matrix is limited by both n and p. It cannot be larger than n, it cannot be larger than p. So in the case of sparse estimation, this would be the norm. 
But in the general case where n is larger than p, and when the data comes from some real-world distribution, this is highly unlikely to happen. What could happen is that some covariates would be very close to other covariates. So we say that they're almost collinear. You can think about them as two lines that are not completely parallel, but very close to parallel. In that case, you better see it here, this would be unstable, computationally unstable. That means it could become arbitrarily small if you think about it as a denominator. So small changes in it due to measurement or calculation would result in big changes in the betas. So there's numerical, potential numerical instability if the covariates are almost collinear and there is complete instability or no, no inverse if they are collinear, as you pointed out. Let's stop here and think about the questions I asked at the very beginning with regard to the multivariate linear regression. What is the hard bias of multivariate linear regression? The linear relationship. It assumes the linear relationship between what and what? The linear model assumes the linear relationship between the answers are written on the board all over the place. Not the expectation, of y. expectation of y. That's what I was hoping to hear. Between the expectation of y and the covariates. Okay? Not between y and the covariates, between the expectation of y and the covariates. That's the hard bias. We are only considering functions of the expectation of y that are linear in the covariates. If the expectation of y depends on some of the covariates as a quadratic or a sine wave or exponential or logarithm, we're screwed. So that's the hard bias. What's the soft bias? Where did we introduce the preference bias? Louder, please. Even louder, a shouting match. When we're estimating the residue specifically, what's the assumption? Where did, we, where, where did I write that doomed me to a particular, that committed me to a particular soft bias? The Gaussian, yes. The assumption of a Gaussian distribution of y around its mean, or equivalently, that I decided to minimize the sum of squared residuals. That's the moment where I introduce my soft bias. What about my search algorithm? Where is my search algorithm? That's the third question. Once I wrote this, I fully defined my hard bias and soft bias. Now it's just an optimization problem. Once you have an argmin or an argmax, you're done with the hard bias and the soft bias. Now you have to solve it. Where's my search? I didn't do a search because I can solve this analytically. So I'm lucky in a sense. Or you can say I chose this model because it's easy to solve analytically. Sometimes you cannot find an analytical solution to this argument problem, to a different argument problem, and then you have to search. Sometimes you can find a solution, you're guaranteed to find a solution, but not uh, by a fixed formula, but by an iterative procedure. And sometimes you're not even guaranteed that you can find a, a, a guaranteed maximum or minimum solution. So the answer to the three questions are here, expectation of y is linear in the covariates, minimizing the squared of the residuals, or in, in terminology of soft bias, we're assuming that y is distributed Gaussian-like around its mean. And here, we don't need a search. We have a closed form solution. Now let's look at, um, at 2A. What kind of regularization might we want to impose? <laughs> 
we do, if you're doing sparse estimation, when p is larger than n, typically much larger than n, we must do regularization, otherwise the solution, the, the formula solution is ill-posed, cannot be inverted. If we are not in sparse estimation, if n is greater than p, we might still want to do regularization. We might still want to push our solution towards um, a particular form. We might still prefer some solutions over others a priori. What kind of regularization can we, can we add here? How about keeping the betas small? So I can keep the betas small with, the, say, a sum of squared betas. J goes from 1 to P. I can do that. That will push the solution towards small betas. What does small beta mean? A beta of 0 means that it does not depend on the, 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 the expectation of y does not depend on this covariate at all. A small beta means maybe it depends on it to a small extent. But there is a problem here. It depends on the dimensions you chose for the covariate. If the beta is small when the covariate is expressed in kilometers, when you express it in centimeters, it might be larger. So you may want to normalize the covariates before you apply this. The second issue is how much do I care about keeping the beta small versus minimizing the sum of squared residuals? I'd like to be able to control how much I care one versus the other. Okay, this is argmin together. So I'm going to put a knob here. A lambda knob. It's a number, a positive number. I can turn this knob to do more regularization or less regularization by changing the objective function here. When lambda is small, that means I care more about minimizing the sum of squared errors. I'm trying to find the best linear fit, regardless of what the values of the betas would be. When lambda is large, I care more about regularization. If I push lambda to infinity, this would not matter and I will end up with the solution of betas all being zero. This is not the only way to regularize. I can think of an alternative way to regularize. How about lambda times sum of the absolute values of the betas? Will I get the same solution if I do this versus if I do that? Let me put this in square root, maybe. Nay, I'll leave it as L2. This is how it's normally used. I could try to replace this part with sum of absolute values of betas. It'll also push the betas towards zero, but in a different way. So these are both very uh, commonly used methods and not the only methods for regularization. This is called ridge regression. This is called lasso. Historically, this came later. Ridge regression has been known for 50 years or so. Lasso is maybe 20 years. They lead to somewhat different solutions. Let me add um, one more possibility. Instead of any of these two, so this is called L2 regularization. This is called L1 regularization. What would L0 regularization be? L0 regularization. It would be argmin sum of, cover of uh, residuals plus lambda times. What would be the L0 here? The number of, the number of non zero betas. Number of non zero betas. I like this one best of all. 
because number of non-zero betas means the number of covariates that play a role. So it would push the solution towards um, simpler explanations, explanations that depend on fewer covariates. This is called subset regression. So L0 is subset regression, L1 is lasso, L2 is ridge regression. The only problem with subset regression is that it's computationally not um, feasible. F fully, maxima, fully minimizing it, solving it completely, is computationally intractable. The beauty of lasso is that it is computationally tractable, and it's the closest you can get to the L0 regression. In fact, LP regression is a convex problem from P equals 1 and up. It's a non-convex problem from below P equals 1. So lasso is the best convex problem of all the convex regressions that we can do in this, in this uh, formalism. Lasso is the closest to L0. It does tend to result in sparse solutions, solutions with relatively few betas, which is why it's all the rage. We'll continue next time.